Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, Stacy and I are fresh back from Hollywood, Hollywood, Florida. Florida. We went down on Friday. I officiated a wedding of a friend uh, yesterday, and so we're we're sort of stumbling, fumbling, a little tired, but it was. There's a lot of people in. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people in. A lot yeah, of people in. It was good. Um, it was good. So we are up here today primarily because we knew we were going to this wedding <laughs> and we knew that my Saturday was going to be shot. And we like to do this. Mm -hmm. We call it table talk. Uh, we usually do it once every eight weeks, maybe 10 weeks, something like that. The last one we did was Fallen mm -hmm. and Free Sunday, I mm. think. Um, and I like to do this when I'm either in the middle or at the tail end of a sermon series because it gives us a chance to sort of unpack some things. Uh, there are always things that I say during a sermon series on Sunday morning that, um, or things that I don't say that I wish I would have <laughs> said. So I go home Sunday after church and I think to myself, oh my gosh, I wish I would have said that. Or, oh my gosh, I wish I would have said that. Uh, or a friend like Michael will send me a quote mm -hmm. about something that he thought about after hearing my sermon, and I'm like, damn, I wish I had that before I had preached, because it was perfect. Um, so this gives us an opportunity to sort of go back and... You can say some of those things I can things say that some of those things if I remember what it say. was I wanted to say. I take a lot of notes, a lot of That's notes on my phone. That's a different problem. Yeah, That's a different right. problem. That is a different problem. <laughs> um, but I take a lot of notes on my phone, so I go back and, and look, and then we sit up here and discuss. We do. Um, so that's what we're going to do. And then we're going to have communion together, yes. which is always a highlight for yeah. us. We love that. Um, so is there anything you want to say by way of introduction? or To, to what we're going to talk about? To whatever. I, I mean... I want to give you, you a said, chance to speak, so I, speak, woman. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> this is it, you guys. Um, I, d I do want to say one thing about the Discover thing that um, I'm going to start a week from Tuesday for women. It's 10 weeks. If you can't come to every week, that's okay. I, it would be better if you could. But um, it's really going to be an organic, um, in intense, uh, intensified group. It's going to be a large group, but it will be um, a very um, intimate group. And we're really going over the 12 steps and how they are tools for our lives, like to use them every day. And so um, if you want to go to that, if you feel scared um, about doing that, if you are like Kathy Pelequin and you say, <laughs> um, I don't know if I want to bring up all my stuff. <laughs> That's what Kathy said Thursday morning at coffee, which I totally understand. Um, uh, but it is. I'm sure she's happy that you just brought that she up. She is. I know yeah. she is. She doesn't care. It's Kathy Pelequin. Um, and so um, it's just, it's something so rich, something that has helped me the last 15 years of my life in some amazing ways. And so I, I love to share those kinds of tools with other people because. You need them too. <laughs> if I need them, we all need them, and so I'm 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 happy to share those. So I'm just really looking forward to it. And so even if you're not going to that, going to attend it, pray pray about it, pray for it, pray for the women that will attend it, um, because it can be extremely intense in in the individual person that's attending. So, and and for me as a facilitator. So. And one of the things that we talk about often here uh, is that. You don't need to be a recovering alcoholic or a recovering drug addict or a recovering sex addict or food addict or whatever to be a person in recovery. No, you're, uh, we're all codependent. We're all on the spectrum. We all have of a, we all have we all have unhealthy relationships mm -hmm. with something, someone, whatever that may be. And we're going to talk about some of those things this mm -hmm. morning, actually. So, I think. Uh, I've preached seven sermons in Ecclesiastes. I have two more, so next week and the week after, and then that series will be over. Um, 
as you know, it's entitled Life Without God. It's a kind of a daunting book. My daughter reminded me that she does not like the book of Ecclesiastes the other day because it can be very depressing, which it can be for sure. Um, and I've mentioned that it's meant to be because it's describing what life feels like without God. Uh, not that any of us can actually live without God because the very air that we breathe uh, is the air that God provides, but mentally, emotionally, uh, we try to do things on our own. And what does life feel like when we're trying to fill voids on our own, when we're trying to find acceptance, approval, love, significance, security, all those things on our own apart from God? Uh, and that's, that's supposed to be a depressing experience. Um, life without God is depressing. It certainly can be depressing, and it's often despairing. Um, so I have two weeks left, uh, but of all the sermons that I've preached in this series, the, the last two, the one where I talked about competitiveness, how we're all inescapably competitive, and the one where I talked about how we are all uh, uncontrollably controlling were the two that got the biggest response. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really, I think the sermon in this series that meant the most to me or that I felt the most was the one from Ecclesiastes 3 where I talked about time and the mm -hmm. passing of time and the storing up of regrets that we often experience as time passes, that it doesn't matter what we do, we can't slow time down. Um, and a uh, real quick side story to that. Um, during that sermon, I, I lost it. I didn't think I was going to, uh, but I was talking about my oldest grandson, Mason, and I said, I can, he's almost nine, and I can remember like it was yesterday, the day he was born, and I lost it. I mean, I, I felt that so deep and started crying. Um, and Daniel uh, cut that into a little clip that I put on social media, and Mason came to stay with us maybe a week later mm -hmm. or something like that, and so I showed him that video when I picked him up in Fort Lauderdale. I showed him the video, and he watched it, and then we, he came over and spent the night, and then I drove him back the next day, and as soon as we got in the car for me to drive him back, uh, he said, Tutu, that's what my grandkids call me, um, and my siblings. Uh, but he said, Tutu, can I see that video again where you talk about me? And so I showed it to him, and he held my phone in his hand and watched it. I mean, you know, watched the whole thing. And as soon as it was over, he said, Tutu, I am so lucky to have you. And I just <laughs> lost it again. Getting on the ramp off on, I mean, from Donald Ross on the 95, I lost it again, almost ran us off the road and killed us both, but, um, but it was super, super sweet. So that was the sermon I think that meant the most mm -hmm. to me because it was super reflective. As I get older, I reflect more and more about the passing of time, moments lost, uh, a, a real deep conscious awareness of s the need to savor moments. Um, but the two that got the biggest response were the ones on competitiveness and control. Mm -hmm. And we spent some time talking about that yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, I've spent a lot of time talking about that with the guys uh, in the church, specifically at the vault. And I wanted to read, um, Jenna, can you hand me my glasses, yeah. please? Oh. No, no. No, I'll, I'll <laughs> let me get man glasses. He doesn't want to. Uh, he doesn't want to wear. Uh, right. Hey, she's you like, need you need my glasses. Down. They're like pink leopard skin. They're I'm green. like, no, I, I don't. They're, I don't need those. They're a guy color today. Um, let's see. Hold on. Let me go back. This is. Um, uh, if you can drink pink it? drinks, you can wear green glasses. Uh, honey, I'm not paying attention to what you're saying. I'm trying to find <laughs> a quote. Um, okay, so. Um, one of the things that I mentioned is that we are, as I said a minute ago, we're all controlling in ways that we may be aware of and in a lot of ways that we may not be aware of. We don't like to think of ourselves as controlling people. We don't like to think of ourselves as people who need to always be in control. But we are all control freaks in a variety of different ways. And we consigned ourselves to that uh, back in Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve 
decided for all of us that we were going to try to do this thing on our own. Uh, and this world is scary and it's chaotic and we've all been hurt in a variety of different ways. And so we're all instinctively self-protective. Um, and that oftentimes fuels our controlling tendencies. But one of the, um, one of the things that I hadn't really thought a lot about, I, I had thought a lot about our controlling tendencies, but I really wanted to get under the surface and, and ask the question, why am I so controlling? W what's behind my controlling tendencies? Um, and one of the things that dawned on me was the idea that the root of control is fear. That's really what fuels our controlling instincts, our controlling tendencies. Fear of what Fear of what needs to happen, that we need to happen. Fear of what might happen. Um, fear that if we don't control this person, they will leave us. Uh, that if we don't control the circumstances, they'll get out of control. So far, so, uh, so, so far and so forth. What? <laughs> When it's so on, so on and Thank so you. forth. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. That was what I was trying to say. So forth and so why. Uh, You're so funny. <laughs> um, so uh, we were talking about this idea at the vault uh, recently, the idea that the root of control is fear. Um, and then we started talking about how that is connected to people-pleasing. That was the subject that, after I preached that control mm -hmm. sermon, I wish I would have spent more time dissecting. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, how does people-pleasing um, connect? How with, is that a form of control? How is that a form of control? Mm -hmm. And a couple of quotes, and then we can talk about it, um, uh, that I wanted to read that were passed along to me. People-pleasers actually aren't trying to please other people. They're trying to avoid their own feelings of shame when they disappoint someone. Every people pleaser has one goal, to control how another person views them. Mm -hmm. When I read that, that came mm -hmm. from a psychologist that I'd never read or heard of before. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I read that, um, dots were connected mm -hmm. in my own head this go ahead no I, no I mean just this idea that I, I think I it's I don't th think we like to think of ourselves as people pleasers people pleasers have a bad rap understandably um but we are all people pleasers in a variety of mm -hmm. different ways I mean some mm -hmm. of us may be people pleasers with flavors. some people and not people pleasers right. with others. There are right. some people that I care very deeply about what they think of me, and then there are others that mm -hmm. I don't care mm -hmm. what they think of mm -hmm. me. But with those people that I care very much about what they think of me, um, I begin to detect sort of people-pleasing mm -hmm. behaviors, people-pleasing right. tendencies, uh, and the connection between that and control, mm -hmm. if I'm nice, if I'm good, if I'm kind, if I'm compassionate, if I'm thoughtful, all of those things. On the surface, it just seems like, wow, there's such a nice, thoughtful, sensitive person. Mm -hmm. But because we're all sinners and sin corrupts us in every part of our being, there is a part, maybe a small part, maybe a large part of uh, even those nice things that we do that is connected very much mm -hmm. to this idea of controlling the way other mm -hmm. people think about us. If you've ever experienced relational rejection in mm -hmm. any way, shape, or form, you're sort of put on guard, mm -hmm. and you don't ever want anyone that you care about to leave you again, mm -hmm. uh, and you become an instinctive people pleaser. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just being nice. Maybe it's if I'm successful, people will be pleased with me. If I sound me. smart, if right. I if I'm beautiful, look if I'm like I'm way. successful materialistically, right. if right. I all of that stuff come off kind of yes. tough, if I come yes. off like I have a really great education or I yeah. I've got it together. Yeah, that is a form of people I'm a good pleasing. Mom it's not just good I want to be nice mm -hmm. to people. It's yeah. all of that. Because there's nothing wrong with being nice, and it's not like that. Every person that's being nice is. People pleasing, but you there, to a there, degree there is, is a but, spectrum, right? Yeah. There, no, I'm, I'm not. Everything we do is tainted with sin, so obviously, but there's, 
but there are some people who are just being nice because they're nice and they're when people are usually people pleasing it's almost they're you know you can it's such a pattern um, and you can see they're debilitated when it doesn't work right. and you can also feel um, the manipulation that maybe comes off of a person like when you really feel like they're only saying all of that because they want me to like them or they want me to be in a relationship with them or they want the job or whatever it is, professional or personal. And I just had a talk recently um, with a woman because I think women, their flavor of people pleasing um, seems to come out often um, a little different than men's. Um, and so I think women are more known for being people pleasers, even though I don't think they are more or less than men. So there's that. And um, but but um, women's people pleasing can be so. Um, uh, we find ourselves apologizing all the time for everything. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry to do. I'm sorry I didn't do that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I said that. Or make sure that you understood how I said that because I don't want you to think that I meant that this way, or that was in this tone, or very, ex you know, explanation heavy about like, so that we're not misunderstood. Um, and that, like you said, goes back to rejection, which ultimately goes back to the garden. But it's something in our lives, someplace we've been rejected in that area, probably specifically, whether it's relational or pre professional or, or personal. But, um, you know, we, we don't want to be rejected again, so I want to control the the narrative about me or, or about what I'm doing or, or who I am or something. And so it, it is. It's, it can be debilitating to the person if they're like, oh, my gosh, I shouldn't have said that. She's, she probably thinks that I'm like this way, and, now, and I'm really not that way. And right. you can see, like, how crushing it is to people, and you're like, I didn't even care that you said that. Like, it, it and didn't it's, cross it's, my it, mind. It's, yeah, I mean, it's paralyzing and it's enslaving mm -hmm. because you're always second guessing what mm -hmm. you said or what you mm -hmm. didn't say or right. what you could have done or what mm -hmm. you should have done or um, uh, th the same psychologist from the quote I just read also wrote this for a long time I wore the badge of people pleaser proudly mm -hmm. I told the story that I quote hated letting people down and wanted to make people happy but the reality is it was about me not mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I wanted to make people happy so I didn't feel guilty. I don't want to say no so I don't feel awful afterwards. Mm -hmm. I want to be there because if I'm not, I might have people talking negatively about me. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, people pleasing is about ourselves mm -hmm. and not wanting to feel uncomfortable emotions. Mm -hmm. In working with people, there's always an aha moment when someone understands that they're not really pleasing, they're controlling. Mm -hmm. They're trying to control how someone perceives them and how they feel. And once you understand this, then you can start perhaps mitigating that pattern. Mm -hmm. um, which is another reason why we talk a lot about increased self-awareness around here. Um, you know, my sermons, there's sort of a, um, uh, a method to my madness in every sermon I prepare. The first half of the sermon is always intended to diagnose us. It's always intended to help us come to a deeper understanding of who we are, how we're wired, what we do, uh, our sort of self-protective instincts, that sort of thing. And then the second part of the sermon is intended to show you what God has done specifically in the person of Jesus to free us from that stuff. Um, and so uh, increased self-awareness doesn't mean that the problems that you face go away internally or externally, but it does help you to navigate those problems when they emerge. Mm -hmm. right. um, and so if we can all begin to admit, yes, we are people pleasers. I never really thought of myself as that way, but now that you mention it, I can see the little ways in which I try to please other, I try to control other people or their perception of me mm -hmm. by pleasing them, um, then it, it helps us to identify that stuff and sort of 
be able to detect it when mm -hmm. it pops up, mm -hmm. not let it run our lives, not let it control mm -hmm. us, those mm -hmm. sorts of things. Well, and uh, people pleasing like control or anything else that we're talking about, any of these traits of ours that that come out in, the, in these different flavors, it's um, ultimately love is one way. Paul's all, you, you say that over and over and over, love is one way. So if we're really being nice to someone, because we're genuinely just, I want to be nice to you, um, there's a, a, a great measure of not wanting anything back from you. Like I'm just doing it to give it to you, to give you a gift. And when we people please, we're looking to get something back. Right. And so it's a transactional thing. I'm, I'm doing something because I need something. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, it's just showing an, an unlove um, in our action rather than mm -hmm. caring or be nice or whatever, thoughtful, whatever the things are. But when we start to, you know, be debilitated or look for something, what am I getting because I'm people ple because I'm doing this thing? Mm -hmm. Then it's, it's like a little self-aware indication like, oh, I was, I was doing that because I hoped mm -hmm. to gain something. I hoped to get something back mm -hmm. and I didn't get it or I did, or, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. And, we, you know, one of the things you guys, you and you, but most of you have probably heard me say for years uh, is the fact that when we know, and this is where the gospel becomes so rich and practical and functional in our, functional in our lives, because when we know that all of the love and all of the acceptance and all of the approval that I actually need, I already have from God, mm -hmm. that begins to loosen our people-pleasing instincts a bit. Because now, um, A, I'm not primarily concerned about getting something back from mm -hmm. you because everything I need, I already have. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm also not terrified of your rejection because right. I know God will never reject me. And uh, it's his approval that I ultimately need and it's his approval that I ultimately have. So right. there is a interconnectedness between these right. things we're talking about, fear, control, people-pleasing, <laughs> and the gospel. The gospel is the only antidote ultimately to these mm -hmm. things. And we spend our lives wrestling with the implications. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. not like we... Mm -hmm. we one day believe the gospel fully and finally and we never have to suffer from people pleasing or fear mm -hmm. or control again, we will wrestle with this stuff for the rest of our lives. But when we do and as we do in those moments where we become aware of these tendencies and are then able to connect the dots mm -hmm. between that and who I am before God. I mean, I, you know, I, uh, back in... 2009, the church that I had planted um, merged with the church that I ultimately pastored in Fort Lauderdale, and um, and it they were two very different churches, very different. Um, and that church, the larger one, had come to me and asked me if I would consider becoming their pastor, and I declined three times. Uh, I had just started this other church five years earlier, and it was growing by leaps and bounds. It was healthy. It was exciting. And the larger church had been dying for years and was not healthy. Um, and so I was like, I'm not taking that job. There's no way I can leave these people behind to go 20 minutes down the road and take this job. So just to get these people off my back, I sort of threw out this proposal. I said, listen, guys, you're barking up the wrong tree. If you want me to do this, the only way I would even consider it is if we merged the two churches. Because if I'm coming, I'm bringing everyone with me. Um, and they agreed. I was shocked. So we went through this long process of evaluating the, you know, whether or not that would work. And we ended up concluding that this is what God wanted us to do. And from the moment I got there, um, I felt rejected by a lot of the people who had been there for a very long time because I wasn't their pastor who had died a couple <laughs> years earlier and had been their pastor for decades. I was different than that guy was. Mm -hmm. um, everything about me was different than that guy was. Um, and I felt rejected. And it threw me, I mean threw me, into a massive identity crisis because unbeknownst mm -hmm. to me up until that time, I had always felt 
accepted and loved and approved by the people that I was around, by the churches that I led, that sort of thing. Uh, and this was the first time in my life, I was 36 years old, and it was the first time in my life where I was now surrounded by people who didn't like me for no reason other than that I was different from the guy who preceded me. Um, and I just, it was a, it was debilitating to me. I was depressed. I was scared. I hated my work. I begged God to release me from it. I mean, it was, it was a bad scene. And I remember uh, sitting on the balcony... Um, of I had taken my family on vacation to the west coast of Florida, and I got up early one morning, and I was sitting on the balcony of the condo we rented, and at that time, I had a Bible reading plan, sort of a plan that taught, told me what to read every day, um, and I read Colossians chapter 1. That was the that was the reading for the day, um, and I, w- I won't read it now, but in those moments... God reminded me through those verses that everything I needed, I already had in him because of him, Mm -hmm. from him. And that was theologically and practically speaking, the largest aha moment of my life up until that point. Because for the first time, I was able to connect the dots between the gospel what God had done for me, what God had given to me, and sort of the inner turmoil that I was mm-hmm. experiencing, the mm-hmm. fear. the I mean, I, I remember, I literally remember praying and saying, God, you've really screwed me here, okay? I mean, I did what you asked me to do by merging these churches, and I'm miserable, absolutely miserable. Just give me my old life back. And I didn't hear him speak audibly. I think I would have been scared had I heard some (laughs) booming voice from God. Um, But I did sense very, very clearly that he said, Tully, and it's not your old life you want back. It's your old idols you want back. And I love you too much to give them back to you. And it made sense to me in that moment because I realized, well, what were my idols? You know, up until that point, I kind of thought of idols as statues and things that people in primitive places bow down to. But I realized that my heart was an idol-making factory, Mm -hmm. Um, that I was, I idolized approval. I idolized people liking me, people affirming me, people accepting me, people loving me. And now that I was faced with the fact that I was facing disapproval from people, Mm -hmm. that's when the approval of God set me free. Mm -hmm. That's when everything changed at that Mm -hmm. moment. I mean, literally. Mm -hmm. And not everything externally, but everything internally in terms of what I understood about God and who I was and what God had done changed. Um, And it also connected the dots for me that when Jesus says in Luke 4, my mission is to set the captives free. And, you know, I always thought growing up in church that that meant, you know, free from hell. Uh, You know, I'm free to go to heaven. I'm free to do the right thing, you know. But it's so much more than that. It's... I I don't remember who said the quote. Maybe it was Martin Luther. I'm not really sure. But um, to paraphrase, um, there's nothing that God has taken from my hands that I didn't leave claw marks on. And in that, he's talking about what we're talking about, which is control. And um, one of the the hardest places, because it's not always control, you know, it's not always exercised and people pleasing. We're kind of honing in on that. But... Um, we like to control circumstances, like you started out saying, um, control the outcomes of, you know, relationships and life events and things going on. Um, and I remember in 2006, I was, um, I had, had recently got remarried. I lived far from my kids. Um, and I was just, everything was seemingly out of control out of my control. And it was, I I was wanting to control things that had to do with my boys specifically, which is in and of itself is not a bad thing to want to protect them, to, to mother them, to, to do. And they were, they were, um, small. Hunter was in elementary school, Cole was in junior high. And I just remember this moment of, um, God, I mean, I was like in the bottom of a shower, just like a wreck and just like, like this can't be how it's going to be. Like it has to be different. 
Like, I can't live if it's different, if it's not different. And my boys are not going to be safe or good or A, B, C, D, F, G. And I just remember God so clearly in, in my head, again, not audibly, because I probably would have died in the shower, but um, just so clearly going, I love your kids more than you do, and I have a plan for them, and I have a plan for you, and I, it's not going to go that way. It's not going to turn out that way, and you're not in control of it. And the more I accepted that truth, that issue didn't change, and it didn't get any easier, but my ability to cope with the fact that the issue didn't change and it didn't get any easier became better in me. And it wasn't because I thought, like, I really need to get better at not wanting to control this horrible situation. That, what, that wasn't it. It was an acceptance of what was, what is, what, what will be, and believing that God is in control, like his ability to give me some measure of faith to trust him in that um, was the key, which was none of my doing. It was him giving me some situation where it forged that truth, forged that belief um, in a powerful way that's undeniable and um, makes it easier in one sense to deal with things that are not going your way, that don't turn out, you know, the, the person isn't healed, the person doesn't get over that disease, the person doesn't turn away from their dis- addiction, you know, the, the court legal system doesn't turn out the way I want it to. Um, there was the, all, the opposite of my fear in needing to control was to believe. I mean, the root of all of our sin is unbelief. So for, for God to build my belief in him, because he's in charge of that, was the thing that was like part of the cure, this side of heaven. Like it's, you know, a gradual here and there in this area and that area, because in other areas I don't believe like I do in this one. But that area of testing, and I think about those places where God has taken something from my hands that I'm holding on to and just want to control and know that it's my job to control in the name of being a mother, in the name of being a a sister or a daughter or a wife or an employee, like, I should control this. I mean, this is a God-given thing, and I should should use what I have to help this situation. Um, And we do those things. We we like to control things, and like I'm saying, in and of itself, sometimes it's not people-pleasing control. It's like, I just want the right thing to happen or the best thing or the healthiest thing, and it doesn't happen. And our control in those situations, we, we don't, we got to hold on loosely because we don't have it. 38 special. There you go. You got it. If you know, you know. Good job. <laughs> um, so when we meet as men at the vault, we do so every Thursday. If you haven't been men you need to come. It's my favorite thing that we do uh, at the sanctuary. If you want Tully to like you, then yeah, no, <laughs> no yeah. I'm just kidding. If you want to please me, just yeah. It's uh, it's a time where we get to share very openly, honestly, uh, about things that are happening in our lives, and it's become the vault has become my support group. I need a support group as much as any guy in this room. Uh, for a variety of different reasons, and it's become my support group. And almost every time, not every time, but almost every time, it comes to me, mm-hmm. and it's time for me to share. Um, I give voice to the fact that probably the, the most painful thorn in my flesh at this stage in life um, is my grandkids for this reason. I have three Uh, None of them will have any recollection of their mother and father being together. Uh, They are being reared in a broken environment. Um, And that kills me. Kills me. Um, I mean, I've told Stacy and Jenna a hundred times, I want all of them. I want them under our roof. I want to raise them. I want to. I want to be. A, we I want to control it. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and there are some very legitimate reasons mm-hmm. why I ought to be concerned. Okay. Uh, I mean, their lives aren't in danger, as far as I know. Um, 
But I oftentimes feel like their hearts are, mm -hmm. that their minds are, mm -hmm. that they're not in the safest environments around the safest people. Um, and that, that scares me, and it makes me want to rush in and grab them and control the situation. And, and yet they're not my kids. God didn't give them to me. Uh, as my children, they're my grandchildren, and I have a certain responsibility and a privilege as a grandfather, but it's not that of a father. It's not that of a mother. Um, and that is the toughest place for me to believe right now mm -hmm. that God loves them more right. than I do. I mean, right. we will wrestle with unbelief. I don't care how long you've been a Christian, how long you say you've believed in God, we will wrestle with unbelief for the rest of our lives. John Calvin once said that we are all partly unbelievers until we die, mm -hmm. all of us. Mm -hmm. So this is an ongoing issue. And once this passes, you know, I take great comfort in the stories that I hear from people, even from some of the people that we spent time with this weekend, of how broken and jacked up their upbringings were and how God used that uh, to sort of, you know, heal and propel people forward. He's certainly done that in your life. Mm -hmm. He's done it in mine. And those stories comfort me. I think God reminds me of those stories. He puts me in conversations with people to remind me for my own sake mm -hmm. that I've got this, okay? I know it's not playing out the way that you want it to. And I think, with, uh, you know how much I hate any mention of politics in the side of the church. What? Don't ever bring it up. I'll smack you in the face. Um, but in church, okay, I've got my <laughs> opinions, my thoughts, my convictions, whatnot. But this is a very important thing for us to keep in mind, especially in what will most likely be a very tumultuous election season, okay? Um, it is... Uh, it is very, very tempting when things in this world are not going according to the way you think they should go. And they never are. And they never will be, and they never have, okay? Um, I mean, it's been like this for a long, long time, but, um, but to think, to, to, to feel the, the angst of needing to control. Um, I mean, we feel it all the time. We feel it with our kids. We feel it with our grandkids. We feel it with our country. We feel it with our spouses. We, hey, Alex, welcome hey, to the party, buddy. Up? I'm glad. <laughs> 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 We're so glad you could make it. Uh, <laughs> so how have you been? No. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so uh, this struggle with unbelief is not just a theological struggle. No. It's, it is a functional struggle. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, and yet, in those moments, fleeting as they may be, when we do believe it, mm -hmm. when God gives us that sort of increased mm -hmm. measure of faith in a particular mm -hmm. moment to believe it, mm -hmm. man, it feels like the weight of the world is taken off your shoulders. That's right. uh, it is incredibly freeing, and that's when, for me, the dots begin to connect regarding mm -hmm. the gospel and Jesus saying, I've come to set mm -hmm. the captives free. Free from that stuff, right. not just free from right. the external stuff. Free from me. Mm -hmm. It right. sets me free from me. Right. Um, it may not change the situation. No. Right. And going back to the church merger back in 2009, the situation didn't change externally for about a year. Mm -hmm. But my ability, like you gave voice to a few minutes ago, my ability to handle mm -hmm. the disruption of my external life mm -hmm. because of the aha moment that I had internally helped me right. get through it without feeling paralyzed by fear and mm -hmm. all of that stuff. So um, so it's it's very, very functional. And it's a it's gift. Real. It's a it's it is what Jesus said he came to do, to set the captives free. Mm -hmm. So when he takes something out of our hands that we're trying to desperately control and um, manipulate in some way to make life easier or better or whatever we're trying to do, it is a mercy that he would take those things and go, that is not yours to hold. That is not yours to control. That is... Um, yes, I love your kids more than you do. And they're mine first. They're mine first. That church is mine first. These people are mine first. They're not, they're not yours, Stacy. They're mine. And I'm in charge. 
and I have to be reminded that he's in charge daily, <laughs> on the daily, and that is um, that is freeing. Yeah. It, it's not a it's not a punish, it's a, it's punishment. Inc- it's a gracious oh. gift to be reminded that I'm it's not a, in charge. It's not my people. Deal with your boy. You're like it's, it's a, I like uh, it. <laughs> no, I mean it's a it's a severe mercy. <laughs> it is. Um, one more quote. Okay. That we can talk about for a minute, and then we'll take communion together. Um, I don't know who said this, but I think this is part of the quote you sent me, Michael. Um, says this, you seek control in your life because you're afraid of exposing any part of yourself that you or others might not accept. Mm-hmm. People-pleasing is a form of controlling. Micromanaging is a form of controlling. Being a workaholic is a form of controlling. And absolutely being a perfectionist is a form of controlling. Somewhere along the way, a part of you wasn't accepted by someone else, and so you learned that it needed to be hidden. And oftentimes, that experience happens long before oh, absolutely. we're three years old, absolutely. four years old. Somewhere along the way, this person goes on to say, the way you learned to reject part, somewhere along the way, you learned to reject parts of yourself for fear of being rejected. Mm-hmm. There is freedom in recognizing the con- that control is really a facade because in reality, you are being controlled by your fears. Mm-hmm. In order to release, you have to face your fear, walk through the dark valleys of your story. Um, and that last part is true, but it's mm-hmm. only possible mm-hmm. if you know right. down deep, mm-hmm. not just in your head, in mm-hmm. your heart, in your gut, in your soul, mm-hmm that the deepest part of you that longs to be loved and accepted mm-hmm. is and it's already in that, in that like like that intersection of those things that you get that like it doesn't happen right. anywhere else except where those things the, cross the awareness the beautiful liberating awareness that you are fully accepted already by God mm-hmm. Uh, only happens typically in the face of rejection. Right. In it's other like words, a, you have to be, you have to feel rejection in order to deeply appreciate God's approval. Right. Yeah, God's it's acceptance, true. God's approval. It's like uh, Steve Brown said when he was here for Fallen and Free, one of the things that stuck in my head that he said um, was, you know, he kept talking about um, kissing the demons in the mouth, like on the lips, and you'll find out they have no teeth. Stacy knows exactly what that feels like, don't you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but I, I, I believe that. I know that to be true, that the things that we fear the most, whether it's rejection or I, I'm not going to be able to do this, I can't do it, or I might make the wrong decision. I have like three things I could do, but if I make the wrong decision or if I go this way and like, what about this? And what about, um, you know, our anxiety is um, part of fearing also like these things are all you know they boil down to this unbelief this this um and if the root of sin is unbelief unbelief is sin like I mean that is what we're working with and just the fear like to just face that fear I know that sounds so trite to go face your fears but that's really what what he was saying like because of what you have vertically in Christ because of all of this acceptance and love and validation and forgiveness that you have, you can face that thing that is so scary. And you can you can crawl, walk, he'll drag you through it. It doesn't matter. You can face it because he's already faced it for you. That is part of what the cross is, facing all of those fears, the ultimate fear that we have of the ultimate rejection, the ultimate distance between God that we don't understand, that we don't have anymore. You actually don't have any distance between you and God now. And we fear that ultimately. I, uh, I, I read a quote this morning from Frederick Beekner. I like him. Um, I like him too. I mean, I never met him, but... Lori Frost did. (laughs) Lori Frost did, that's (laughs) right. Yeah, she did. Um, Let's see if I can find it. Uh, Let's see. He says this. Now, he's talking about the the problem of evil, but Mm. in many ways, it's Mm. a little bit of what we're talking Mm -hmm. about this morning. And he said this. There have been numerous theological and philosophical attempts 
to solve the problem of evil. You know, if God is good mm -hmm. and if he's in control, mm -hmm. then why does he allow bad things? If he's good, uh, he must not be in control. And if he's in control, he must not be good, that sort of idea. Uh, in philosophical, theological terms, that's called theodicy. It's the, mm -hmm. it's the art of trying to solve the problem of evil in light of who God is. Um, and so he says there have been numerous theological and philosophical attempts to solve the problem of evil. But when it comes down to the reality of evil itself, none of those attempts are worth much. Christianity ultimately offers no theoretical solution. It merely points to the cross and says that practically speaking, there is no evil so dark and so obscene not even this, but that God can't turn it to good. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one beautiful thing that we get just by looking at the cross. Mm -hmm. I mean, here was the second person of the Trinity. God made man dying naked in a shameful way on a cross, a criminal's death that he did not deserve and I can only imagine the disciples and Jesus' mother at the foot of the cross thinking in that moment, mm -hmm. this is the worst mm -hmm. imaginable thing that could have happened. Our mm -hmm. friend, our brother, uh, our son mm -hmm. is being treated like a common criminal. And all he did was love people and help people and serve people mm -hmm. and wash their feet and so on and so forth. God at that time. Um, <laughs> and, and he's being murdered shamefully. Mm -hmm. I mean, that may have been the first time some of his disciples had ever seen him butt naked, okay? <laughs> Seriously, I mean, that you have to think about me. He's in front of a group of people. I mean, it's a shameful, painful death. And nobody who was standing at the foot of the cross that day looked at it and said, this is the most beautiful Their thing that's ever happened. came to the surface, this everything. Is, the, nobody thought this is mm -hmm. the most beautiful mm -hmm. thing that could be that's happening right. in human history. Right. And yet we look back now mm -hmm. uh, with the help of time, and, and call perspective, it good Friday. and we call it Good, good Friday, Friday. Um, good Friday. because the best possible thing happened in the worst possible circumstance, mm -hmm. and that same thing happens in our lives mm -hmm. all the time, mm -hmm. that we're so afraid of rejection or things not being under control the way we want them to be, or things not panning out, and that fear paralyzes us. And, it looks um, like everything is out of control at the foot of the cross, and it's absolutely not. And for us to be reminded in those moments mm -hmm. um, of who God is, what he's done, and what he's promised to do, uh, is very relieving. And like I said, we will struggle to believe that for the rest of our lives. I'll, I, I can say all of these things with conviction and passion right here, right now, and I guarantee you, for some reason, this afternoon, <laughs> I will not believe what I just said. <laughs> right. I'll believe it in my head. Absolutely. I'll believe it, yeah. you know, theoretically, I'll right. believe it intellectually, but emotionally, functionally, right. I will set that belief aside. Absolutely. And that will happen. In yeah. Mark's, I believe, help my unbelief. 